Greetings and welcome to Student Exposure, where we highlight student-produced projects created by participants in DCTV's training program. I am your host, Mallory Isaacs, and thank you for joining us. Today's episode of Student Exposure focuses on the art of war. We'll explore the intersection of art, culture, and combat by taking a look at the role of African-American soldiers in World War I, the spiritual forces of Aikido, a Brazilian martial arts technique that combines dance and music, and we'll see how some women in D.C. are learning to protect themselves with self-defense. This is Student Exposure, The Art of War. again for joining us for Student Exposure, The Art of War. It's time to get started with our first segment. When the United States declared war against Germany in April of 1917, the War Department quickly realized that the standing army of 126,000 men would not be enough to ensure victory. African Americans saw this as an opportunity to not only enlist, but to also win respect and endear themselves to America at home in the midst of Jim Crow and segregation. James Wesley, from our story tours, describes the nation's call to arms and the African-American response. At the time, the United States needed more men. Uh, the white soldiers' numbers were down for European battle. Uh, so the president opened up a call, put out a call for more soldiers. Uh, the African American responded well. Uh, in 1917, they started the selective service. Uh, they had a quota. Within one week of putting out the quota, uh, the United States had more than enough soldiers to supply the United States for overseas combat. The United States at the same time through Jim Crow and racism, uh, it did not change when the guys went into the military to fight for their country. Uh, they experienced a lot of lack of training, poor food, poor conditions. The white soldiers did not want to uh, live in the same area as the uh, African-American soldiers. So they had the same racism that was in uh, the American society. It carried over to the United States Army. They jumped at the opportunity to fight and defend their country. Uh, they believed in the democracy uh, they wanted to prove to society that they were loyal, uh, serious Americans, and they gave up uh, all their development uh, activities at home to participate and go right into the military. The African American community supported what the men were doing. It's noted that the military did not give the soldiers ample opportunity to go into combat, which they joined for. They had them doing a lot of labor, a lot of uh, dominial jobs. So the community put pressure on the government to have these men actually go into combat, to be on the front line, to represent America the, the way they wanted to. The French commanders, uh, the French soldiers, uh, they were taking a beating, and the arrival of the African-American soldiers, uh, it boosted their morale. They loved them. They opened the door for them. 
They presented them with all kinds of medals, all kinds of awards. Our entertainers uh, went to France and they were accepted primarily because of what the African-American soldiers did. They set the tone for uh, the future soldiers as well as uh, African-Americans coming to France for other reasons. Uh, the Harlem Hellfighters was the unit, the 369th uh, of all African-Americans fighting alongside of the French. Uh, the Germans gave them that name because uh, they were tough soldiers. They didn't lose an inch of ground. They never lost a man to the Germans by capture. They lost a lot of them by death, but they never lost a man by capture. Henry Johnson and Needham Roberts were two soldiers uh, of the Harlem Hellfighters. Uh, they, they are highlighted because they were on sentry duty one night, about 2 a.m. About 20 Germans tried to infiltrate their area and they started a fight. These two men defended the soldiers that they were protecting. Needham Roberts was injured. He got shot, he couldn't move, but uh, Henry Johnson fought on. He's throwing grenades, shooting, he ran out of ammunition. He used his rifle as a club. He started beating them. Uh, his rifle fell apart. He had a bolo knife. He pulled that out. And by the time he finished what Germans were left, uh, they spent a lot of time trying to get out of there because he was a tremendous soldier. He gave up a whole lot that night uh, defending his honor. And at the same time, the unit was able to go capture an uh, ammunition depot uh, because of his effort. They honored them with the uh, highest award that a soldier could receive, the unit they were in. There were over 171 men of the 369th who received the highest award that the French could present. And there were other units that were in battle uh, that also received awards. But Henry Johnson and Needham Battle, uh, they were the, the outstanding uh, soldiers of the war. What a powerful story. Here in the studio is DCTV student producer Michael Banner. Welcome to Student Exposure, Michael. Thank you for having me. No problem. How are you doing today? Wonderful. So tell me, what do you want viewers to walk away with after viewing this video? Well, essentially, I would like for viewers to understand that the African-American soldier was actually fighting two wars. Mm -hmm. uh, the war of segregation and mm -hmm. Jim Crowism at home, and then fighting against fascism abroad. And it was the sheer will of the African-American soldier, the strength of that will, that kept him from being torn asunder. True. And so, so how did African-American soldiers respond to the actions of the U.S. government? Well, you know, again, that's a conundrum because you're asking someone to go fight against fascism and right. establish democracy abroad when at home you were facing less than democracy. So it was the African-American soldiers' intestinal fortitude that made them stand in the face of fascism and even established uh, the basis in the uh, application for democracy for themselves and for others to, 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 to follow. Right, so it's a kind of a, a bit of an internal struggle. No doubt, no doubt. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It was an interesting piece, and we thank really you. appreciate your time. All right. Thank you. The heroics displayed by the African-American soldiers were recognized by the French, yet this bravery still goes relatively unrecognized in America. The ferocity and sacrifice the Amer African-Americans displayed fighting for democracy abroad should be recognized here in America. Blood, sweat, and tears, that fight continues. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who would love to put up with you. Welcome back. In our next segment, Aikido, The Art of Peace, 
we'll take a look at a unique, lesser-known Japanese martial arts style that is anchored in the principles of peace and harmony. DC Aikido Martial Arts Executive Director and Aikido Instructor Ryan Bausch explains what Aikido is and how it teaches us to address conflict in a non-violent and empowering way. Let's take a look. Aikido is a Japanese martial art. It incorporates utilizing the energy of your opponent. It's not a striking art. It's a grappling art where you use pins, joint locks, and throws to neutralize or redirect the energy of your opponent. So it doesn't require any strength because you're using the strength, power, and speed of your opponent. The word Aikido in Japanese, as you can see it here on my shirt, I, Ki, Do, the three characters break down as follows. I refers to harmony. Ki refers to energy or the spirit. And Do refers to the path or the way. So if you translated it into English, you could say Aikido means the path of harmony or the way of peace. The goal of Aikido as it relates to dealing with conflict resolution or aggression is to find an alternative way of dealing with it. As human beings, we're programmed to respond in a natural way to conflict and to use aggression when we're angry or scared. Aikido forces us to find a more conducive way or a more peaceful way and oftentimes an easier way of dealing with it as it applies to the physical sense. But that requires a lot of study and mental training, and as well as physical training. You know, as human beings, we respond in a certain way. When we're scared, we freeze up, we back away, and we want to use strength, or we want to use the same force that we're being met with. Aikido is a training of the whole mind, body, and spirit. It's a philosophy, as well as a martial art. So when you're learning it in the physical sense, you are in essence learning how to control an opponent, not by force or coercion, but by blending with their movement, by accepting what they're giving you, rather than meeting it with force. Philosophically, you're also learning how to deal with conflict, and it could be anything, with family members in your workplace, people you don't know, you run into on the street, it teaches you how to resolve those issues without giving that conflict because when there's all that conflict there's really no room for any resolution. Aikido trains you to build that room, trains you how to use your circumstances to find a better or easier way to reach an actual resolution. I was originally attracted to Aikido mostly because of the challenges it presents as a martial arts system. You, you want to use strength when you're grabbed. You want to you want to fight you want you because you want to get away with aikido you have to learn how to relax and be calm and be loose so it's a lot of psychological training as well you have to be comfortable with having punches come close to your face or really strong people grab you and not immediately freaking out about it aikido is is also known as the art of peace and even in the word aikido the way of harmony or the way of the spirit we find that it's a unique approach to conflict resolution. This is it all? It's not going to work. You guys need to make sure you're coming in nice and low. Get in. Keep throwing as you extend. So use that lever to your advantage. You should make it extremely easy. But Aikido's philosophy is not worrying about the, the, the opponent in the sense that they're better than you. It's focusing on the self and improving yourself and through that, spreading that peace and that harmony. 
What an insightful piece. Joining us in the studio to talk more about Aikido is student producer Itana Finkler. Welcome to Student Exposure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No problem. I feel really calm after watching that segment. I can't help but feel Ryan's aura through that piece. So tell us a little bit about Aikido and how it kind of impacts the unique DC community. Well, I think that, that Aikido appeals to um, kids and women and older people mm -hmm. um, and disabled people because it's not about strength and power. Mm. It's a philosophy based on harmony and peace. And um, so uh, I saw when I was learning about Aikido, I saw children who were really gaining confidence and I saw a, an elder instructor, female instructor who was flipping um, a, a larger male. Wow. And so it, it's really something that um, you can learn confidence in your life for, um, for changing the energy, changing aggressive energy. That's awesome. It seems like it's also a way to kind of center yourself and, you know, reduce your stress and anxiety. So from a personal perspective, how has learning about this process kind of affected you personally in terms of like your actions or how you see things? You want to tell us a little bit more? Yeah, well, it's interesting because while I was taking this course, uh -huh. actually, and had seen, the, seen Ryan at the studio uh, at DC Aikido, mm -hmm. um, I had an incident where I kind of was starting to have an argument with someone. Okay. And he was being what I could, you know, kind of macho it seemed, and, and I <laughs> react difficult. immediately, and yeah. I get a, I see myself getting aggressive right back. Right. And I calm myself down, and I started listening, and I started just being with what was happening more, mm -hmm. and I felt like I could see that right then in my mind that Akira was helping me. Um, mm -hmm in my personal life mm -hmm. to just transform a situation and, and be less aggressive. And uh, I can see how that can work at the workplace or in relationship as well. That's awesome. I think I'm going to have to adopt some of what I've seen and learned from you while I'm driving in this thick DC traffic some days. So Yeah, it's practice. <laughs> it's practice. A practice makes perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us in the studio today. It was great to learn more about Aikido in DC. Well, thank you for having me. No problem. When confronted with negative energy and aggression, Aikido teaches us all to roll with the punches and maintain our spiritual centeredness. In a world where violence, bullying, and conflict are all too prevalent, Aikido is a refreshing and incredibly valuable system that can be used by people of all ages, sizes, and levels of physical strength to protect and defend themselves. Stay tuned, more student exposure, the art of war after this short break. Welcome back to Student Exposure. In this next segment, we'll take an inside look at the history and techniques of a Brazilian martial art that combines elements of dance and music. Universal Capoeira and Gola Center in Washington, D.C. gave us exclusive access into the world of Capoeira in the district. My name is Jesse Winston uh, here at the Universal Capoeira Angola Center in Washington, D.C., and I'm a student and a bit of a teacher, too. Capoeira Angola is many things at the same time. Uh, some people describe it as a martial art. Uh, some describe it as a cultural activity, a type of meditation, a healing art. It's uh, dance. It's, it's liberation in active form. Uh, many people tell different stories, and I don't think you'll find the same answer from anyone. Uh, some people argue that it started in Brazil. A lot of people uh, say that it came from Africa. And from what I've studied, I see that it comes from Africa also. But 
in its early form, it was a combination of uh, cultural elements based upon where people lived and how they lived. But when they came to Brazil, they had to see the overlap in their cultural characteristics and ended up sharing them, which created capoeira as we know it. The Jenga is the foundation of the capoeira movement. It's uh, basically known as a side to side, back and forth step, but it could be many other things. Uh, sometimes it might not even be that basic step, uh, but it's used to move from one movement to the next. It's used to hide intentions. It's used to confuse your opponent. Uh, it exists in a way where in normal martial arts traditions in the Western world, you imagine someone having a fighting stance. Uh, and they might hold that stance and look for a position, but with the Jenga, we're always moving. We're not sitting still to be seen. Hi, I'm Clarice. I am a student teacher here at the Universal Capoeira Angola Center in Washington, D.C. As a martial art, Capoeira Angola is a lot more, it's a, it's a lot more uh, African culture incorporated into it. Um, it's not, it's definitely not the same as other martial arts that people know about like karate, or Taekwondo or uh, Jiu Jitsu. Um, Capoeira Angola is, is very different. Um, especially when you see Capoeira Angola, it's a lot of dance in it. The dance is used to disguise the martial part um, in Capoeira Angola. And uh, you just have to see it for yourself. It's, it's very interesting. Why I decided to study capoeira? Uh, when I first encountered it, it was just dumb luck. I had moved away for graduate school and happened to move just three blocks away from a guy who was teaching it. And he was a student of uh, one of our great grandmasters, Sean Grangy. And uh, I had no idea what he was doing. I'd heard of capoeira. I'd seen Haitian now, but I'd never seen Angola. I didn't know there was a traditional game. I didn't understand the uh, African origin of it. So in seeing it, it was just like a whole other world I'd never imagined. I only understood martial arts from like a competitive uh, idea. I studied Aikido and Taekwondo, kickboxing, and plenty of bruises, broken bones, trips to the hospital, uh, head trauma, things of that nature. And I knew I couldn't continue that for the rest of my life. And, but with Capoeira, I would see people who were 60 and 70 still playing. Um, and doing things that I couldn't imagine doing in my 20s. Uh, one of the other things, um, the person who first introduced me to it said it was a healing art. And at the time, I didn't understand what that meant, uh, a martial art that's healing. And I only could think of a martial art as a fight, a way of beating someone. And so with that, I realized that capoeira is more so for me, that the more I do it, the more it benefits me in ways just beyond uh, combat. That's, it's like just a small percentage of the benefit of it. There are just so many other things to gain from it to help me in my day-to-day -day life. interesting piece. Here in the studio we have Francis Ampa. Welcome to Student Exposure. Thank you for having me. No problem. That was a really interesting story. So what other aspects or elements or kind of the history of Capoeira make it so unique and interesting? Well, Capoeira started from Africa through the slave trade to Brazil. Mm -hmm. So while the slaves learned to preserve themselves and defend themselves from the slave masters, they started practicing Capoeira. But when it started being discovered and, um, shall I say, restricted, yeah. they incorporated music and dance to it. Mm -hmm. So over the years, the tradition of the martial art music and dance is still being practiced today. So kind of touching more a little bit on the uniqueness of capoeira, what are some other elements that you can tell us about the art of capoeira to share with the audience? Well, people that practice capoeira often say that it's a very spiritual mm -hmm. practice. Um, it's 
very fluid. Um, as you can see, the movements stay very close to the ground. Right. So they stay very in tuned and very one with themselves and the, their opponent. I feel I'm, I'm not very coordinated, so I feel like if I was doing that with someone, I would right. like whack someone in the head. Oh. So did you learn any like basic moves on how to kind of begin the art of capoeira to kind of avoid that? Right, so um, the Jenga is one that was um, explained where it went back and forth right. and side to right. side. So I think what makes it very interesting is it's between you and your opponent, mm -hmm. so everything else doesn't matter. So I think balance comes naturally where you just... You can feel it yeah, out. Yeah, you just stay low to the ground <laughs> and just avoid the other person's legs. Really. Okay. That's, I feel like I could do that, and I think our viewers could probably manage to oh. master that as well, too. Yes, it doesn't matter how old or how young you are. It's for, for everyone. everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us. That was Thanks a great, great story. Me. No problem. All right. The art of war comes in many forms, and today we have learned about the significance of capoeira. This Brazilian martial art was developed by African descendants as a means of protection and self-preservation during slavery. Currently, there are different forms and techniques of capoeira that are practiced worldwide. Coming up next, women's self-defense in D.C. Did you know kids who play outdoors have healthier lungs? Totally. Did you know that boys that play with dolls make better husbands? My son has lots of dolls. But did you know terry cloth diapers breathe better? I did. Mm -hmm. Totally true. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you guys mm -hmm. know statistically friendly kids have more friends? Yeah. That's obvious. Did you know most people think they're using the right car seat for their kid, but they're not? Parents who really know it all know for sure that their child is in the right seat. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to make sure your child is protected. Welcome back to Student Exposure. According to the World Health Organization, one in three women experience some form of intimate violence in their lifetime. Yet, the field of martial arts and self-defense is a male-dominated field. Today, we will talk to the women of the District of Columbia Self-Defense Karate Association about what it means to be a woman teaching self-defense and why women should take self-defense. These women mean business. As a woman teaching women, I understand where they're coming from as far as how they're socialized. So there's a way that you can teach men that's very different from how you teach women. And for women, it's important for them to see that they already know a lot, that they already understand, in fact, how to be able to stand up for themselves verbally and so forth. And then we give them more confidence by literally practicing the verbal strategies and the physical strategies and how to project so that you appear to be calm, confident, and aware. That alone can stop things. Plus, martial arts in two ways teaches women to trust their instincts and trust their intuition. Number one, we talk about it. We talk about if somebody was coming up and you felt a little something, what would you do, what positive action would you take to keep that from happening, to trust your own inner voice that's telling you something's up. Also, the way that martial arts training uses the brain, left brain, right brain, constantly working together, strengthening the corpus callosum between them, also literally makes us better at left brain thinking, better at noticing what our intuition is telling us. So we teach four rules. Number one, address the immediate danger. If the immediate danger is you just feel, with no known reason that somebody's going to do something, get out of there. Don't be worried about, well, I'll look stupid. Get out of there. Take action. Later, you can laugh at yourself because you moved because you were scared. That's only smart. Get out of there. The second thing is, if it's a physical thing, you address the immediate danger by, what is it? They're choking off your wind, the, the carotid arteries are choked off. You have to remove that and then counterattack simultaneously or as soon as possible. Finish them off to where they are incapacitated or they're out. Martial arts is not enough. I learned martial arts and I had some confidence, therefore, but I didn't understand the techniques. I didn't understand the strategy. That is why I started teaching. Because I thought, there's a lot of martial arts instructors out there. Women, men, kids can go to any of them. 
and they can get in shape, and they can learn martial arts. But they could be like me. I was very serious at three years of training and not a clue how to defend myself. I think, I think that women should study martial arts and self-defense because I think we are often targeted in society and we are seen as generally weaker. Um, even those of us who are not small in stature, there's still this sense of vulnerability and a sense of that we're an easy target. And I think that one thing that training in martial arts does beyond just learning the techniques, it creates a confidence. There's an air about the people who train in martial arts. When I meet women from other places, I immediately have that sense that that's something they do because their confidence, the way they carry themselves, uh, is just different. And I think it, it is projected to the people around us. And also, it's a sense of calmness that we know if we're in a situation, we have the tools to address it and to get ourselves out of it safely, um, intact, and, you know, um, and to deal with the attacker or deal with the situation in a way that is best for um, our own safety. I was, when I grew up, I was told to be quiet, to never make a scene, and if, uh, if I was uncomfortable, to squash that because I would never want to make somebody else uncomfortable. That's how I was raised as a woman. And she understands that because that's how she was raised too and many women are still raised that way. And so in her teaching there's an assumption that yes, this is how you've been taught, but you know what? You gotta let her rip. So when you are when you when you're doing you know, good for, through the self defense exercises, um, I had the hardest time yelling, raising my voice, I'm told, do not raise your voice. Again, don't make a scene, nice girls don't do that. Well, you know, here they do. What a really inspiring piece. Joining us in the studio today is student producer Stephen Reese. Welcome to Student Exposure. Hey. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm trying to keep my distance. I don't know if you're going to take what you <laughs> learned oh, you say, and you say, try you it say, on me. You're safe, okay. You're safe, you're safe. <laughs> so tell me, why did you choose this particular subject? That's a very good question. Uh, as you can see, I'm not a woman, mm -hmm. and no one in my production group is female. Okay. So it's not a natural subject for us. But what we come to find out is that we have wives, mm -hmm. we have nieces, we have sisters, we have mothers mm -hmm. that are impacted by this very important idea. So if we can empower them to feel more safe, that helps everybody. Absolutely, especially when you look at the data, and I think it was one in three women are yeah. experienced some form of intimate or violence in their life. I right. mean, it's, it's really important to have that experience behind you. Yes. So tell me, um, what did you and your co-producers learn while working on this project? The main thing was it expanded our worldview. Mm -hmm. uh, we live in a male-dominated society, and we're all men, like I said before. And we, if you think you're a hammer, you see the world is full of nails. Mm -hmm. And by studying with these confident, powerful, empathetic women, it gave us a different way of looking at the world, and we thank them for that. Absolutely. They were pretty powerful. And yeah, definitely... I was scared a couple times. <laughs> Well, you came back in one piece, yeah. so they didn't tear you up too much, so Not it's good. <laughs> well, thank you so much for thank sharing you. the work from you and your group. Really inspirational. Thank you. There are approximately 75,000 domestic violence survivors in Washington, D.C., and of those women are mothers, daughters, sisters, and friends. Let's do something to help them protect themselves. For more information about the District of Columbia Self-Defense Karate Association, contact Carol Middleton at dcstka at earthlink.net. Three, two. DCTV is not your ordinary television station. We are a membership community of people just like you. Grandmas, teachers, tastemakers, artists, leaders, students, activists and enthusiasts who are learning, creating, and sharing media through a platform built to empower you to express yourself. You can take one of our media training courses where you can learn things like producing, videography, how to edit video, or operate a television studio. We put the power of media in your hands with unprecedented access to state-of-the-art media facilities and equipment. You can get your hands on HD cameras, produce a show in one of our fully equipped studios, or 
edit your projects in a private suite. Unleash your voice and be heard by airing your self-produced programs on one of our seven, yes, seven cable channels. DCTV is more than just television. We will be your cheerleader, your advocate, your mentor, and your motivator. We are your voice. We are your network. Join us at DCTV.org. Well, this concludes another episode of Student Exposure, a student production of DCTV. I am your host, Mallory Isaacs, and we're so glad you joined us for today's episode, The Art of War. We hope these stories were informative, inspiring, and helpful to you. For more information on programming or opportunities at DCTV, visit our website at dctv.org. Also, follow us on Twitter and Facebook to stay connected with DCTV events and projects. See you next time.